people of Earth, it's Bright Garlic here, and welcome to Shortcuts number 15. It's Friday the 29th of March 2024, and today I wanted to talk about how we treat our world versus how ETs treat their worlds. And for those of you who've never heard me talk about my experiences, what I wanted to say is that I have met a lot of ETs and talked to them about their worlds and spent considerable time on a world uh, called Nelsi I-35. And so I have some sense of having spent a lot of time there of how ETs view and treat their world. So I want to address this issue today because it's something that never gets talked about in uh, ET UFO law, and I don't know if that's because people don't have these kinds of intimate relationships with ETs, or they just haven't reflected on how we actually are. And I think this is a critical issue if we really want to understand how we can go out into the cosmos. We need to look honestly at how we treat our world, and how ETs treat their world, because they, if you like, create a benchmark for us to aspire to. And for people like Elon Musk, who think that we can just go to any world and set up a colony and pill for that world and set up a new civilization, I'm here to say you've got that all wrong. It just won't be allowed. And part of that reason is because of how we treat our own planet. So let me first reflect on how we treat our world. So the first point I want to make is that we act like humans first, other life forms second. And we make many choices regarding what we want without ever considering them. The second point I want to make is we destroy land and ecosystems, rivers and oceans for human progress. Once again, without any consideration of any other life forms, we pollute our world with sound, light, smell, odors, air, ocean, water and land is polluted with light, sound, noxious, dangerous chemicals, solid, liquid, gas materials on every scale every scale, and we pollute with radioactive materials. The next point I'd like to make is that we disrupt the natural flow of energy on the Earth. And if you think about this very carefully, you'll see that we do it with our roads, with electricity and electricity infrastructure and Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi infrastructure. We do it by destroying ecosystems and killing vegetation and with the creation of pollution. So I urge you to reflect very carefully on how we humans disrupt the natural flow of energy on Earth and the implications of that for other life forms. We also overpopulate our world with our own species, totally ignorant of the flow on effects that so many human beings have on ecosystems and other life forms and energy and the overall health of our planet. We view other things on Earth as resources and commodities, not as things with intrinsic value in themselves. And one thing we do incredibly well is we lay claim to everything. We create nations, we separate them with borders, we hunt and harvest any plant or animal that we so desire. Every ecosystem, every landscape, everything that we see is a resource in the air, in the sea, above the ground, below the ground. We also turn every place over to tourism, as if it's okay for anyone from anywhere to go anywhere. And we create land ownership and separate and defend it with fences and in some places weapons. 
So this innate desire to lay claim to everything has been with humanity for a very long time. We travel all over Earth where possible and leave few places just for the natural world. And that has a very dramatic impact on the natural world. And we see our world as a discrete, separate entity from our existence. Not that we are one with it, and without it we have no existence. Oh, and a simple point that I overlooked before. We have agriculture, and allow Earth to be decimated by agriculture everywhere. And we use destructive methods to maximise productivity, polluting the earth, destroying ecosystems and other life forms. The primary focus of agriculture is to create food for us, but we do that at the expense of everything else. So that is essentially how we treat our world. Now, I've not said anything about some of the positive aspects, and I'll quickly touch on those. We do create sanctuaries, we create parks, be they uh, forest parks, or desert parks, or marine parks. We do have places where we're not allowed to go in and cause rampant destruction, but at the same time, we're still going into those places. There are very few places on earth that animal and plant only, human free, and there ought to be. There are also many people who do care about our world, many people who are working in preservation and conservation, in repairing the damage that's been done, in trying to save species on the brink of destruction and extinction. And there are many ordinary people who love animals and plants and do their best to connect with them and to look after them. But for the most part, we treat our world terribly, and that is reflected out into space for others to see. So here's how ETs, and particularly the NELSA that I know well, but other ETs as well, and I'm referring to spacefaring ETs only here. Here's how spacefaring ETs treat their worlds. They see each of their worlds as a world for countless life forms to coexist. And they respect their existence by making choices that cause as little harm as possible. We are human-centric, they are planet-centric. They do not destroy land or ecosystems where possible, but consider the needs of all beings in such places. They do not have agriculture or use non-destructive forms of agriculture. Where possible, food is created with matter creation technologies. Now, there are exceptions to this, but they are still non-destructive. They do not pollute their worlds. They use matter creation technologies for the creation of materials and the disposal of materials. They do not disrupt the natural flow of energy on their worlds. First off, they do not create roads, or if so, they create minimally invasive, simple roads more like paths. They, many of them at least, use doorways, what we would think of as special doorways, connecting one place to another. There is no widespread electricity infrastructure or Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi infrastructure. They use non-invasive forms of energy transmission. There is no destruction of ecosystems and no killing vegetation. And as I said, there is no pollution. So they do everything in their power not to disrupt the natural flow of energy on their worlds. 
And here's a critical thing that we will take centuries to understand. They regulate their population so that it is in harmony with the other life forms on their planet. They've realized they must have small populations relative to their planet size and will not occupy other planets until they have resolved the population issue. In other words, you don't become a fully-fledged spacefaring race until you have resolved the population issue. You've managed to bring it in harmony with other life forms on the planet. Then you have demonstrated you can go out to space and occupy other worlds and cause little harm. And I guess a critical difference between them and us is they do not view other things on other worlds, be it their own world or other worlds, as resources and commodities. Although some less developed races will eat other animal life forms, most do not. And I say that as an exception. It is a very small exception. And those that do so do it in a way that's not barbaric, not highly destructive, and as considerate as possible. And here's a critical thing that we just cannot get our head around because this is the fundamental backbone of, of who we are. They do not lay claim to everything. There are no nation states, no borders, no land ownership or separation with fences and defences, no hunting and harvesting plants and animals for the most part. I wouldn't call it harvesting anyway. It's it's much more respectful than that. Every ecosystem and landscape is treated with respect and where possible it is nurtured. And there is no tourism in the sense of profit. But there are, I guess you would say, carefully crafted opportunities for guided exploration and respectful exploration. For example, on NLCI 35, they have many visitors come but those visitors whilst allowed to most places know that there are certain places where they need uh, local people to come with them and to guide them both for their own safety there are some dangers there and also so that they can move through those places as respectfully as possible so there's no such thing as come to our world Go and see this, we make profit. That just doesn't exist. Now, similarly, they do not allow travel all over their world in terms of their own kind, whichever races that is, whichever planet that is. They leave many places just for the natural world. Take Nelsi 35, it's a much larger world than our own a much smaller population. They have left many places for other species to thrive without them being in the way. So on many worlds, they have what we might think of as sanctuaries where no one is allowed to visit unless they have a very good reason, such as monitoring a population or helping to nurture a population, something like that. So these worlds are incredibly rich in biodiversity and these particular areas are very, very rich in biodiversity and the life forms there have been allowed to develop however they wish without the interference of the presence of those particular people. And here's the critical thing to understand. It's, it's so obvious, but we don't understand it in terms of how we function. ETs see their entire world as one entity, but also as countless entities. So that duality. They see everything as connected and thus treat their entire world and all the life forms on it with respect. 
If you hurt another life form, you are hurting yourself. So everything is respected. A little example tie into this last one. When I visit Nilsi I-35 and I spend time with my family there, the dude's family there, they live in, in uh, I guess you'd say, it's sort of generally speaking, a U-shaped clearing between forest with a small hill in front. And there are many creatures that come out of the forest and move around their homes. They make no effort to send those creatures away. They make no effort to cause any harm to the forest. Their ancestors from billions of years ago destroyed the forest. They do not. So they recognize, that's just a small example, they recognize that they are connected to everything. It is them, they are it. Their entire world is one. So that's, that's true for all spacefaring ETs. And this is a point of maturity, a hallmark of maturity, that you recognize your world as one entity. And what you do to others, you do to yourselves. So anyway, that's just uh, my take on the differences between how we treat our world and how ETs treat their world. And hopefully from that you can see how far we have to go to really become a spacefaring species. Thanks once again for listening, people of Earth. I'm Bright Garlic. Have a great day of human life. Cowbunga dudes and dudettes.